Like that's for me to go. Or for I, me. I've, I've been fishing with you. I know. <laughs> that's, that's right. Aye, with the llamas. That's yeah. right. Fishing with llamas. It's a long story, but it's <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to uh, Good News for Armagh. Uh, welcome to this segment that we're doing on the podcast. And we're just actually calling it People. We've found a name um, because we're interviewing people that have come to know the Lord and come to know their lives changed by him. Uh, but before we get to our person for tonight, uh, welcome back to Paul. Paul, how are you keeping? You doing rightly? You're keeping well, John. Although a couple of people asked me recently how I was doing and I've been told I look frail, gone. <laughs> And that I've lost weight. Um, <laughs> so, no. so I don't know. I, I feel fine, but apparently I look very sickly. So sorry to anybody that watches this for my frail, ghostly figure. That's always nice to hear, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Very good. Very good. Um, okay. Well, here, listen. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming on with us um, tonight. Patty. Patty Francesco Cavalieri. Really, really, really good um, to have you on, Patty, and thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat to us tonight. And you're going to tell us a wee bit about yourself. So, Patty, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a wee bit about who you are. Yeah. So, like you said, my name is Patty. Um, very Irish first name, but I was actually born in Italy, and I lived there till I was seven. Um, when the whole family moved over here to Ireland, um, and I went through all the childhood and the rest of that in Ireland, and now I'm a primary school teacher down in County Wicklow. Um, and I live in Wexford. You live in Wexford. Do you speak Italian? I do. I do. I lived there till I was seven. And when we moved over, dad refused to speak English to us because he wanted us to keep the Italian. No so way. we all kept it. And do you speak a little Irish, a little Gaelic? Oh, absolutely. I teach it as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, good on you, boy. Good on you. Very good. I, I tried to learn it. Um, and it's very, very difficult language uh, could you more tattoo that's that's me <laughs> that's, that's a great start if you can ask someone how they are you can you can get by in any conversation <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely uh, very good very good well patty thanks for coming on um what are you into patty like tell us uh, not only like what you do for a living but what do you what do you do with yourself when you're not at work yeah but i suppose my favorite things to do are a bit of hiking and camping um, if I can get out into the into the mountains and spend a bit of time there, I'll be happy. Um, recently as well, I don't even know if I can quite call it a hobby because I don't get to do it very often at all because there's nowhere to do it near me. But a bit of indoor rock climbing as well, um, whenever I get the chance, is always good fun. I've been doing it for the last few years, very very unregularly, but um, I'm enjoying that at the moment. I enjoy a wee bit of the bouldering too, Paddy. Good fun. It's but a good same thing. thing. Don't really get to do it very much, but it is. And you don't get very good when you don't do it very often, which can be demoralizing. There's a big one on the M50. There's a big one. Come on, there is called Awesome Balls. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've driven by and think, oh, that'd be nice, but you're always on the way to the airport or doing something. So, yeah. Well, oh, I know. Never time to stop. Oh. Very good. Very good. I'm not in the rock line. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> you can go for a little excursion. I, I'll go. I'll go the hill walking maybe, way, but <laughs> not the rock climbing. I'm okay without that. Um, so you're you're a teacher then, Paddy? Yeah, primary school teacher down here. What led you into that, or how did you? Why did you go into teaching? Uh, I didn't really know what to do with myself until kind of second last year of secondary school, which is I know we'll get to that, which which is when I became a Christian, and then um. I kind of started thinking, well, okay, I, I don't need to just pick a career. I need to pick something that God wants me to do with my life. And again, I had no clue whatsoever. So my head, I was going down the route of, well, I'll do something I could do anywhere in the world because then at least I'm flexible. And in my head, the two things were teaching or paramedics. And I'm very, very, very squeamish. <laughs> and I've been teaching Sunday school and really enjoying that in church. So I went for teaching. <laughs> very good. Uh, my wife's a doctor and on her elective, she went to Zambia. And she was really excited. Uh, we were going out at the time. I'm really excited and about doing, going out there and being a medic out there. And she came back with all these gross photographs of all the operations that she got to perform out there. And I tell you, bleh, 
folk. Yeah, I wouldn't enjoy that. My sister gets a lot of joy. She's training to be a doctor. She gets a lot of joy about describing her placing to me. <laughs> the weird thing, isn't it? It's horrible, it's isn't it? Yeah. Unbent. Actually, loves draining cysts and stuff. Ah, oh, John. <laughs> folk, folk. Definitely not geared for that. So you went down a teaching line. Well, here, let's segue into that then. How did you then come to faith? How did you become a Christian then? Yeah, so when we moved to Ireland, um, we, we joined this little school in Wexford and um, mum got chatting to a few people in the car park at the school who invited her to a Bible study, um, which led to my mum um, send, starting to send us to kids clubs and to different things that this couple were doing in the town. Um, and it was at these kids clubs that I started going to at about the age of seven or eight uh, that I started hearing about the good news of Jesus. I started hearing about the fact that I was a sinner and that my sin needed to be dealt with before I died. Otherwise, I couldn't get into heaven. And I started hearing about how Jesus died on the cross so that I could be forgiven, so that this son could be dealt with. But as, as any eight to eight year old, I, it didn't really bother me all that much. I didn't I wasn't all that worried about my sin or worried about dying. Um, I was more worried about, you know, what was for dinner that night. And I remember distinctly sitting in this exact kids club when I was 12 years old. I was in my final year of primary school. And I remember sitting there while the message was going on. And I was, I was thinking about what was for dinner that night. I can't remember what was for dinner, by the way. But I remember sitting there thinking about that. And then the speaker said something along the lines of, um, what happens if you walk out this building today and you get hit by a bus? Very stark, very, very real. But it was at that moment that I actually realized, well, if I walk out this building today and get hit by a bus, I'm not going to heaven. I haven't dealt with my sin and, and suddenly my dinner wasn't the most important thing anymore. It was, um, oh, I need to really deal with this sin. I need to sort this out because if I go now, then I'm not going to heaven. And, and it was at that moment that I, I asked God to forgive my sins. I thanked him that Christ had died on the cross for them. I asked him to forgive me through that sacrifice. And, uh, and that was the moment that I, I, I got saved in our terminology. Hmm. At eight years old? Twelve. Twelve years, 12 years old. old. Yeah. Brilliant. So eight years old was when you first came in contact? That's when I first started going to these clubs, yeah. And it wasn't until I was 12 that, mm. that it really hit home, yeah. Very good. Did you have any background before that? Um, so obviously that's when you first moved. But when you were in Italy, did you have any religious background no. or spiritual background? No, none at all. None at all. We were your typical um, your typical church-going family, church on Sunday, on Christmas um, and Easter. Um, we wouldn't really have gone the rest of the year. And, you know, there was a Bible on the shelf in the house, but it was dusty and unopened. Yeah. And so it was like very nominal kind of. Absolutely. It wasn't anything more than that. I wouldn't even really say there was faith in the house. Um, you know, um, there was background of molecular biology and stuff like that. And, and that way faith was never really talked about. It was more uh, science and evolution and all that. And, and all that changed gradually as, um, as we, as we one by one started becoming Christians. And did that, like, did that background of science then push God out of the equation? Was that the idea? I don't remember talking about God growing up at all, really. I don't remember him being brought into any conversations. Um, so, yeah, I think it did. I think it did. I remember learning about science and learning about different molecules and stuff like that from my mum. But um, I don't remember learning about God until until we started going to these kids' clubs. So, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And your, your mum's the biologist then, yeah? She is, yeah, yeah. And she was the first one of us to become a Christian and... and um, and quickly started reteaching us what she had been teaching us. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Oh, very good. That's good. And your sister that you were saying earlier on, she's a Christian as well? Yeah, I've got two, and both of them are Christians, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Very good. Very good. Well, a bit, everything, one of the questions I had down here was that like, the Christian faith is based upon the Bible. Like, How do you come to terms with that, Paddy, like, um, in believing the Bible as the word of God? Yeah, so... As I said, I became a Christian when I was 12 when I asked for forgiveness for my sins and, and, and God placed me apart, adopted me as his son. Um, but I didn't really do anything about that until I was about 16. I didn't really understand what I'd done. I didn't really um, engage with my faith at all until I was about 16. And then when I was about 16, um, the same person who was preaching at that kids, kids club challenged me to, to have a think about how I was living my life and whether I was living a life pleasing to God or not. Um, and it was kind of then that I had to decide. I was like, well, this is either the truth and I need to give my whole life to it or this is nonsense and I can forget about it and something inside me just 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 told me it wasn't nonsense and but then I had to go and test that for myself and, and I just said to myself right I'm going to take this and I'm going to test it and if it's true I'm going to live my life for it and, and I took my bible and I started studying it and I got help studying it uh, and I put it to the test and I started praying to God to show me that these things were real that I was reading and um 
and, and in the end, I just ended up giving my life to God because I believed it. It was all true. Um, he was he was listening to me. He was answering my prayers. And um, and I decided that this was for me and this is what I was going to give my life to, because if it's the truth, then it deserves everything. Um, a lot of people ask me afterwards, you know, because there was this big change in school and things like that. They asked me, but how do you know it's true and all this? And, and they were looking for like scientific or historical evidence and stuff like that. And at the time, I didn't have any of it. I actually wasn't interested in like the scientific evidence or historical evidence because you hear I heard so much science in my life that that just wasn't going to work for me. Um, I needed to see it and see it be real. Uh, and that's what I studied for. And, and that's what I prayed for. Uh, and God came through and, and showed me that, that this is real. I think you, you made an important distinction there, Paddy. You said, um, and I would feel quite similar like that as well. It's it's either Christianity is either true or not. Uh, the middle ground doesn't make sense for me. And even now, I would think, you know, if I if I don't believe this, why would I? You know, why would I go to a church on Sundays? Why would I get involved in things during the week? Why would you give money? Why would you help? Why would you invest energy in something? That just isn't true and um, so for me it's it's real or it's not and um, but i think a lot of people are in that middle category where they're dabbling in it they fully believe or haven't fully understood um or aren't fully committed um and, and what, what would you say to somebody then that was maybe in that category maybe don't mind going along to your church um on sunday and uh, maybe for the kids bring the kids but they don't actually believe or haven't actually committed. What would you say to somebody like that? I suppose what I would say is what we believe, what the gospel is, is that Jesus died for our sins, that, that he shed his blood and he died for us uh, uh, to give us salvation, to give us a way into heaven. And not just that, but a relationship with him and with God himself. And um, I remember uh, at that time when, when I was 16, when I was going through these things, I remember beginning to feel... Um, like I'd taken this gift when I was 12 and I turned my back on God uh, and I felt guilty for that. And, and I, I confessed that and I repented of that before God. And I said, I don't ever want to turn my back on you again for what you've done. I, I want to I want to live my life for you because you've done this for me. And, and that's what I would say to these people. I'd say, if you really believe that Jesus died for you, then, then he deserves your life. He deserves your devotion. He deserves your energy, your time, your worship. Um, because he's given the greatest sacrifice for you. So, so there's no sacrifice we can really make for him that isn't too big. Mm. Very good. And and they can they can ask him like what you did as well, Paddy. Like you said, right, okay, if this is real, you show me. Mm-hmm. And and Absolutely. so if someone's listening there, someone could take the Bible, take the gospels or take the Bible and say, God, right, you show me. Yeah. And God Absolutely. could do that. Like, so I think that's and in different ways for everyone. I mean, he, he does it in different ways for everybody who asks. But just very specifically for me, he made it obvious to me that this was real and it was either live for it or ignore it. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that putting it to the test. There's not many world religions or belief systems that encourage the the followers to actually test. Mm-hmm. Generally, it's just, you know, just just keep going. Just do, you know, do what you have to do. Um, very, it's it's uncommon for a for a world religion or faith system to say test it, mm-hmm. you know, examine it. And uh, if the I think a, a good famous example of this is a book, and then now there's a movie called Case for Christ, uh-huh. where uh, has a family, the the wife becomes a believer, um, complete different background, becomes a believer, and uh, the husband's opposed. He's a journalist, and he sets out to disprove because in his mind there's now another person in the marriage that he didn't sign up to and um, so he sets out to disprove and uses his investigative journalism to try and disprove the fact that Jesus rose from the dead um, but very very interesting if anyone's interested in that but same thing it's true or it's not and it can be it can be tested and it will stand up it is a brilliant great book, book too. yeah it's a brilliant book that I'll actually put a, a link for that book uh, Lee Strobel, the case for Christ in the description um, of this podcast. So that would be helpful. Um, brilliant. So Paddy, you were saying there that after you took the Lord seriously and he showed up and he showed you um, that your life changed, how did it change? Started off with simple things, really. Do you know, um, I was a 16 year old in school. The first thing that really changed for me was my language. 
and that was the most evident thing to those around me. Um, I stopped using the Lord's name in vain. I stopped using swear words. Uh, and that was instantly evident to the people around me, you know, and they'd start commenting on this and saying, oh, well, why, why aren't you talking the way you used to talk? And that kind of led to the other changes. The other changes were, you know, I stand up for my faith. Um, I, whenever people ask me questions, I seek to share it with them. Um, I encourage questions, which isn't always easy. Um, but just standing for my faith was the first thing that really had to change. I had to stand out. I had to be different. And particularly because I'd been in this exact friend group and school environment for so long, it had to be drastic because there had been a drastic change in my life. And then gradually, as you go on from there uh, and you study your Bible more, God shows you more and more things that you can change in your life to be to be more of who he wants you to be and to get involved more in uh, his local work. So I got stuck in, in in the local assembly, the local church. I started teaching Sunday school, I started heading to Bible studies and prayer meetings and just devoting my time and my energy to, to things that were useful to God rather than enjoyable for myself. Do, do you know? When you say that, I suppose some people would hear that, you know, things enjoyable to yourself and they they might think, you know, so you're not allowed. Does that mean that you can't enjoy? Does that mean that it's um it's just stuff you have to do? Is that what God is like? He just makes us slave away. Um how, how would you what would you say if someone was thinking that when you when you said that? How yeah, you, and a lot of people would have challenged me on things like that. Um they would have said, oh, do you know, you're not coming out to play football on a Sunday morning anymore. Or oh, you skipped a camp last weekend because because you had a church on Sunday morning and things like that. And they were telling me, oh, you're, like, surely you're not enjoying yourself anymore. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, like the time I still have, I still put it into things I enjoy. I'd go on a hike on a Saturday. Um, on a holiday, I'd go camping. But I actually really, really also enjoy spending time with other Christians. I really enjoy going to prayer meetings and Bible studies. God, God changed me from the inside out. And it's not that I don't do the things I enjoy anymore. It's that the things I enjoy are different to what they were before. Some of them are the same, but I really enjoy what I'm doing now. And I really enjoy being at these different things. And God actually lets me use the things I love to serve him as well. Um, you know, like I've taken lads from the church camping and we've done Bible studies in, in, out, out, out in campsites and, uh, and had prayer meetings around bonfires. And I've used it as time to bond with them. I've gone hiking with a few of them and various things like that. And God will let you use the things that you love to serve him through them as well. And he's not going to restrict you on that. And he doesn't want you to have a boring life. Um, my life is far more exciting now than it ever was before. I devoted myself to God. Very good. That, that might actually sound strange to maybe a lot of people listening, <laughs> that you enjoy going to prayer meetings and enjoy <laughs> reading your Bible and enjoy going to spend time with with christians and that but it is it is a genuine fact that um those kind of things become real and we do them not out of duty but we do them because we want to and and i think that's one of the class things about coming to know jesus in a relationship that going to church is not because i have to but i want to reading our bible is not because i have to but because i want to praying is not because I have to, you know, we're not earning anything, we've got it. And it's about a relationship and that's that's great. Absolutely. And just to expand on that fact that God doesn't want to quench your the things you enjoy. Uh, as I said, I was about 16. I was I had about a year and a half left of school whenever I devoted my life to God. And, and um, I kind of felt when school finished, I was like, okay, before I go to college, I really need to ground myself. I need to work out what it is I believe so that I can defend it in this new environment where I don't have home support and things like that. Uh, and I decided to take a gap year uh, before I went to college to do that. Uh, and all I prayed to God was, look, I, I think I want to take a gap year. I want to do what you want me to do. But will you just shut the doors to any opportunities you don't want me to do? And I just applied to everything and anything. Um, and it turned out only one came back positive, And it was this brilliant gap year that I spent in Scotland, up in the Highlands, in an outdoor center, uh, working there. So all the things I love. Plus more, I learned how to kayak, I learned how to canoe. That's where I started rock climbing. Um, that was the one opportunity God left open. And it was a Christian center as well. And I got a really good grounding in my faith, which prepared me for college and prepared me for, for everything I'm doing now, I suppose. But it could have been anywhere. It could have been some college somewhere or some sort of, you know, nine to five job. But no, God provided something that he knew I would love. Um, I had a great year out there. Very good. Send, send the link to John then, Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you need a gap here, John? Oh, no, no. Boys, you need to go fishing with me. 
Like that's for me to go. Or for I me. Have, man. I've been fishing with you. I know. <laughs> that's, that's right. Aye, with the llamas. That's yeah. right. Fishing with llamas. It's a long story, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <It's this. laughs> that's the way weird things weird things happen in the north. False <laughs> advertising. This place advertised that it was a fishery and <laughs> it was everything but I'm not even sure there's one fish in a leg. But anyway. <laughs> I do like a bit of fishing though. I like it when my feet is on the are on the ground, you know, not not rock climbing. Um but but so what you were saying there, Patty, um there's there's definite joy and, and happiness in Christian life. What is what is the what is the best thing about being a Christian? I think I think the best thing for me anyway, it's whenever whenever you do something, um and you know you've done it for God, there's this there's this immense joy that you've done something right, you've done something lasting, you've done something that matters and that makes a difference. Um, and along with that, you get the, this peace and this confidence that's very hard to explain. The Bible calls it a peace that passes all understanding, that just you just know things are right when you're serving God. Um, and I, and I, you, I mostly know that because when I mess up and when I slip away from serving in times, that's, that disappears do you know, and I think the best thing about Christianity for me is just knowing that there's a purpose to everything, um, knowing that I'm serving God, knowing that my life has a purpose and knowing that what I'm doing for him, it actually makes a difference. Um, it gives it gives meaning to life. Mm. That's, that's, good. that's actually one of the reasons why I came to faith, that whole idea of purpose and finding that whole meaning in life. Um, and it's something that I treasure, to be honest with you. Uh, because it's, you can it's... just you can just go through the motions and it can be fine mm -hmm. um but but you know when you're doing something for god when you're when you're helping another another believer with their faith that you're doing something that matters and that matters to god and that and that he's going to be proud of you for which is an amazing thought mm. I spoke that guy it was in curry's today and i spoke that guy um and he said he asked me what i what i did and it's like i teach the bible in a local church and he was like, oh, well, it's good to help people, isn't it? It's good. That's what it's all about, you know, about helping people. And I wanted to say to him, I didn't get a chance, but I wanted to say to him, no, 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 this is, this is different. It's, it's, it's a, you're, you're getting into the purpose of why God has created you. And that's just completely different than just helping. And that's what Christian, that's why Christianity is unique. is because you're actually getting in line with God and understanding why you're here what this life is for and where you're going. And that's the class thing about it, you know? Yeah, it's incredible. And even just, just the, thinking about some of the stuff that we've talked about, and if someone was listening, I think it could almost sound like, you know, you, you made a decision at 16, Paddy, then to, you know, you're going to serve, use your life to serve God, and you've been attempting to do that since, and you do find joy in it and, you, and things. But I think it's important to say as well that, it's not just at 16 that you thought, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try now and do this. Like whenever you, you become a believer, you actually become a new creation. It's not just as you were, but now you try hard to serve God with your life. You actually become a new person. It's like you're, you know, you're, you're reborn, born, born again. There's a new, there's a new Paddy that takes place, God actually makes you new, and that's why your desires change. It's not just you decided, I'm going to do this now. You actually are a new creation. God makes us new when we trust in Him, gives us a, 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 a spiritual rebirth where we have new desires. There's spiritual desires that come from Him. Um, so it's not just, you know, let's try and serve God now, let's do it, come on and try and enjoy ourselves. It's actually a whole new birth, a new life, a, a turnover, like people talk about turning over a new leaf, but this is a whole new life mm -hmm. um, with new values and desires and, and purpose. And then as you're saying, when you, when you live for the purpose for which you're created and made, then you find true joy. Um, as I, I, I've used plenty of power tools and different things for jobs they're not meant to be used for. Um, and it never really ends well for the project, for the tool, or for me. Um, but when you're, you're doing what, what you're designed for, then, and that's what you're describing. And I think everybody must realize they're, 
there is a purpose. There is a reason why we're here. And that is to serve our creator. And he will give the desire and the motivation and the, the ability to do that. It's not just us working hard for him. Mm, absolutely. And But when we do that, we do get that joy and that, that peace and that sense of, of purpose in our life. But um, I think we'd all agree that life is not all roses. It is tough. And I've just actually finished reading through Job. <laughs> if you ever want leveled to what life's about, you read the book of Job. Um, it's, Patty, how do you deal with that? Like the, the difficulties and the struggles of life, like being a Christian, does that make it different? Yeah, it does. Um, before you're a Christian, the, the struggles, the difficulties, they can kind of seem just like something you have to surmount and get through and play on. Where, whereas now that I am a Christian, it's kind of just given me a change of perspective um, because I believe the promises of the Bible. I believe that God is with me through it all. Um, I believe that, that Romans chapter eight promises that he works all things together for good for those who love him. And it just gives you this different perspectives of when times are bad. Um, the perspective of, first of all, I'm not alone in this. God is walking through it with me. God is going to help me through it. And the Bible also promises that he'll never throw anything my way that I can't deal with that I'm not strong enough to deal with and that he won't help me to deal with. I have the perspective of it will end one day, no matter how bad it is, th this suffering will end, whether it's in this life or whether it's in heaven, this bad time, the suffering, it will come to an end and God will bring me to heaven where there'll be no more tears, no more pain. And then there's also this perspective you get where you know that, that God wants good for you. So you know that, that this situation you're going through, whatever it might be, it's shaping you into a different kind of person. It's God can use these situations to, to help us to learn lessons that we can maybe pass on to other people, uh, to help us to depend more on him at times, to teach us more about himself. So suffering as a Christian, bad times as a Christian, they're different because, again, they have a purpose. The bad times have a purpose. And, and you get this new perspective with based on the promises of the Bible that uh, this is not just a bad time, but this is... Uh, a learning opportunity this is temporary and i'm not alone in this very good no and that that totally changes the whole dynamic of difficult times eh? mm -hmm. um i just love that idea that that whenever we go through difficult times that that we're not alone and and probably the big factor that i love is like the uniqueness of christianity is that god knows what it is to suffer and Jesus Christ became a man and suffered. And because he has suffered, he knows how to help us. Like, so if you're sick, Patty, I know um, to get you tissues. I know you to make a toast and marmalade and, and sugary tea and put on Den 2. Is it Den 2? Yes, we would have CVVs up here, but like we call it Dustin. Was it Dustin? What was Dustin on? Well, Dustin the it is easy to get out more and go bolder in Dundee Valley. <laughs> Talking about stuff like that. <laughs> well, I know how to help you. You know, I know how to help you. So, and, but, and the Lord knows how to help us. Um, and that's just the class thing about, um, about suffering. Paddy, what's next for you in life, do you think? Don't know. I'm very happy at the moment. I, ha I have a great job teaching in a great school. Really, really happy there. Um, what's next is whatever God wants. Um, I try to pray as often as I can that, that he'll keep me on his track for my life and, and not my own track. And um, hopefully I'll notice his leading when it comes. Um, as we all do, I mess up occasionally and, and I don't notice things or, or maybe I'm not looking for things. Um, but whatever he would have for me, I'm very happy at the moment. I'm, I'm serving in a, in a church in Gory. Um, I'm uh, doing various things in there and I'm happy to keep doing that as long as God wants me to. Very good. Good. Brilliant. Well, listen, really, it's really lovely to, to meet you um, and to hear your, I've, I've never heard your life story, so it's really good to hear that. So, um, Paul, would you like to uh, say anything as we... I do. I, I like Polly. He's do. good. <laughs> I do. I, I tell people that. I, not, I don't get, I feel like I don't get enough time with Polly. Only ever see him again. Is you're uh, very far away. The north is a very distant place when you live down here. Uh, no, I know, I know. I know. I know. I think he's good. We Francesco there. 
Wie ich fand es ich sehe, it does stick the name does stick, doesn't it? It does, it does. That's gonna be it. Well, it's a good, they should have swapped it around. I mean, Paddy just doesn't sound very Italian. It should have been Francesco Paddy. Yeah, Francesco yeah. Paddy. I think it's gonna be from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so, but listen, but listen, Francesco Paddy, thank you so much um, for coming on the podcast and Paul as well. Appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening. I hope it's been a help to you in your journey. If you have any questions, any comments, um, or anything you would like to know, um, please do uh, get in touch uh, with us. Uh, you can get in touch through Facebook or email. Uh, good news for Arma. So thank you so much uh, for, for listening and Slango Foyle.